So friends, now is the time for the Dhamma talk. So what is, what is the Dhamma? Now if you ask most Buddhists, you know, what is the Dhamma, they'll say, oh, that's what the Buddha taught. But then when you ask them further, what did the Buddha taught, teach? They say, the Dhamma. So which came first, the Dhamma or the Buddha, the chicken or the egg. <clears throat> now, the, as we have seen from many uh, suttas, the Buddha always mentioned that, you know, he didn't invent the Dhamma, but he simply rediscovered the ancient path leading to the freedom of the mind, uh, the ancient path that had been uh, lost over a long period of time. But basically the teachings of the Dhamma are about the laws of nature, but especially the laws of nature that govern the operation of the mind in the world and how different minds interact producing reactions and creating a lot of unnecessary problems and sufferings. The Buddha was specifically interested in the laws of nature that uh, especially are directly related to the suffering, the various types of suffering, mental suffering, physical suffering. And one of the, the basic laws of nature that he discovered was, you know, the law of, of karma. And it's stated briefly in the two first verses of the Dhammapada, that all actions are led by the mind. Mind is their master, mind is their maker. If one acts or speaks with an impure mind, then suffering follows. As the cartwheel follows the foot of the ox, and in the same way, if one acts or speak, uh, speaks with a pure state of mind, then happiness follows, as your shadow follows you around. So this is one of those uh, laws of, of nature. It's very similar to the laws of uh, physics uh, and the law of gravity. So you know what the law of gravity, if you throw something up, what happens? Sometimes with a big thud, right? So in that way, if we throw something out of our mouth, like certain types of speech, that goes out in the world, goes through the minds of other people and causes a reaction in them that then comes back like a boomerang uh, to, to affect us. 
And if it's an action from an impure state of mind, then a painful kind of reaction will come back to us. And if it's, uh, you know, uh, an action or a thought or a speech based on a more uh, mellow and pure state of mind, then well-being and comfort and happiness uh, comes back as a, a result. And it comes back in another law of physics, which is Newton's law. For every action is an equal and opposite reaction. So if we put out a lot of hatred, we'll, we'll, we'll receive back a lot of, uh, you know, hatred or at least some anger or other unpleasant kind of sensations. And if we put out, you know, friendly, kind, uh, uh, helpful types of uh, speech and actions and those kind of more peaceful or harmonious things come back to us. But basically what that, uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, telling us is that basically, you know, all of our actions that come for the mind, that it's really our thoughts and intentions that is producing most of the problems in our life. And as you all know, the, the precepts, like the five precepts, and last night you were reciting the eight precepts. So all of these precepts are indicated by, you know, abstaining from these kind of negative, uh, unwholesome types of thoughts that are motivated by greed, hatred, and delusion, you know, killing, stealing, lying, cheating, raping, pillaging, and plunder. They're all motivated by thoughts of, you know, lust, greed, anger, hatred, attachment, egotism, and, and so on. <clears throat> so, the, the, you know, the whole Dhamma practice is about, you know, how to increase our happiness and to avoid, you know, pain. And, you know, it's the, the nature of all living beings is to live in harmony and to avoid uh, pain or, to, you know, the, the search for happiness. You know, they even uh, tell us that in our, what, the, is it the Constitution or the Bill of Rights or whatever it says that, you know, uh, all beings are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. and to avoid pain. But even in something as small as a tiny little ant, if an ant is crawling on the ground and you put your finger down in front of it, it would usually, what would happen normally? It would stop probably, right? And pause and then maybe go, go around or go back, but why? because it senses some danger there, right? And it wants to be free from danger and live in happiness. It just wants to go find some food. But all of a sudden, this finger came down. Just like with the World Trade Center on 9-11. People were out trying to mind their own business, you know, working in their offices, walking down the street, and all of a sudden, boom, the towers came down. And people panicked, ran. You saw the videos. Why? Because they, they, want, they didn't want the pain. They were shocked. They were terrified of the death and destruction that was about to unfold. So anyway, I'm just <laughs> mentioning that to show that, you know, at the, the base of every, you know, life is that desire to be happy and free from uh, pain. So then, why do people do things that bring them pain? Hmm? I mean, if you think about it, right? If people really want to be happy, why are they doing the various things that cause them pain? Going out and do, doing crimes uh, against the people or whatever to get what they want and then wind up spending their life in prison? Or worse? waking up with guilt, worry, remorse, and fear, uh, 
about worrying about getting caught and other things out of greed and desire to consume things. Uh, you know, we eat things that are bad for us or bad for the body and cause us, uh, you know, body problems. Or, uh, you know, so many things like that. So uh, it caused them pain. So why do people do that? Even though people want to be happy, they do the very things that then bring their bodies unnecessary suffering by getting stabbed from having, uh, you know, <laughs> stole something or, or beat somebody or, you know, get indigestion or, you know, from taking substances or taking LSD and jumping off a building and, you know, killing yourself, so many other things. Because has, people haven't understood these basic laws of nature. And, you know, just, just observing five precepts. It is said that, you know, just by observing the five precepts, right, to avoid from killing, is that such a big deal? To avoid from stealing, is that such a big deal? To avoid from abusing others by sexual greed and, and lust? Is that such a big deal? Lying, cheating, cursing people, uh, belittling people with speech and intoxicating the mind? So only, only five precepts, five little bitty precepts. Why can't people follow them? <clears throat> and that was Buddha's question. And that's what uh, got him to go on a search for, you know, truth. So anyway, uh, it boils down to people can't control their mind. They can't control their urges, thoughts, and so on. Or they think they can control them just by wishful thinking or certain other types of uh, things, uh, but, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily work that well or that easily. So anyway, the, uh, you know, that's what uh, drove the Buddha to really want to explore the nature of the mind. And so that takes us back, if you can bear with me for a little bit, we we'll take a little journey back in time, if you like, to sort of explore how did all this happen? How did this mind come to be? This mind with its all uh, entangled in the web of kama and with the desire, greed, anger, all the whole gamut of emotions and negative emotions that cause people to do so many things to harm themselves and to harm others. So we'll take a little journey back in time to the moment of conception in the womb. So the mother and father produce these material elements, you know, one cell, little new uh, organism. And then consciousness comes and is the spark that kind of animates that organism or causes the, the spark of, uh, you know, cell division to happen. And then that process of nine months, the new baby goes from a one cell organism to a multi-billion or even they're saying trillion cell organism now in the space of nine months, you know, cell division, you all know what that is. And with each division of the cells, consciousness is going into each of those new cells too. So in nine months, you have this organism and basically that whole process was occurring in the present moment. And basically the consciousness and the cells were being produced at the same time. They were intimately connected. And the whole process was occurring, you know, in the present moment. 
So the mind and body was basically fused together. Seeing how that, you know, every, every cell of the body has a kind of consciousness. But then at the time of birth, what happens? Baby comes out and the doctor, you know, gets out his scissors and cuts the cord. Now the baby gets disconnected from that life force, becomes a little separate being. When the baby is first born, it doesn't have any sense of I or me. It doesn't even know anything. It doesn't know who his mother is or his father is or anything. It experiences sensations, of course. It can see things, but it has no idea what they are until gradually it starts learning language. And then the parents give the baby a name, little Johnny, little Susie, and all the relatives come over and hold it and goochie goochie goo, you know, and start calling its name. But the baby doesn't start looking right away. He hears words, but it means nothing. But after a while, maybe some months, I don't know exactly how long, maybe some of you mothers know that uh, when the baby first starts recognizing its name and looking. So the same with Mita, a cat. So we gave it a name when we first got it. But, uh, you know, we called it Mita Mita, but it didn't, you know, react or look until uh, some months later. And whenever we say Mita Mita, it started looking. <laughs> so anyway, So the baby starts, uh, you know, realizing that, oh, that word has something to do with this thing. You know, and then it starts to get some kind of identity and then it starts learning language. You know, the mother and father are pointing that, oh, you know, that's daddy, that's mommy, that's doggy, that's kitty, that's brother, that's sister. And little by little, it starts to its attention gets drawn outside before it was still basically, you know, together with uh, the body. But little by little, the awareness gets drawn outside. And then it starts, you know, crawling around and wanting to grab this and grab that. <clears throat> and then the the sweet grandmother comes and gives the baby its first chocolate. The first time the baby tastes the chocolate, then it gets a, a big grin on its face because it's producing a pleasurable feeling. And then after that, the same, same grandmother comes and gives the, the person the, that the the baby, the chocolate, and it's, then it starts to identify that face with pleasurable feeling, because it's the pleasurable feeling that, uh, you know, as identified with the, this chocolate. Uh, and it, then it starts to hoping that the, that face comes again in the future, anticipating that it will be, a, you know, bring it what it wants to get the pleasurable feeling. And maybe the father or the uncle or somebody else holds the baby too tight, squeezes it, or maybe doesn't give it anything. And after some time, the baby just develops an indifferent feeling for the person who didn't give it anything. And maybe be aversion to somebody that caused the baby some pain. Or the cat comes by and the baby grabs the cat's tail and the cat turns around and scratch and the baby got bit <laughs> and it starts to have a fear of the cat. So now all these different types of perceptions and ideas about objects starting to get fixed in the mind of the baby. And that's the beginning of the past and the future. 
because as the baby experiences different pleasurable feelings, it starts to anticipate or want those pleasurable feelings again in the future. And it thinks the pleasurable feeling is inherent in the object that produced the pleasurable feeling. But it's actually just pleasant feeling that the baby wants. Attention. And the fear and aversion for anything that caused it the pain. It doesn't want those things to come again in the future. So it's remembering the past and then projecting the future either with more desire or with fear uh, worry and uh, aversion. And, you know, that that same process gets, you know, continues with almost everything that the, the baby comes into contact with. And this is how the, the past and the future are actually created in the mind. And it's based on pleasure and pain. So the past and the future are based on pleasure and pain. You can't separate them really. Because we want ideas that are going to bring us do things that bring us pleasure in the future. And to avoid and worry about getting painful things coming to us in the future. So, uh, you know, precepts would be broken on account of both of those. We break the precepts because of greed and wanting things we can't get, so we force that on onto others. Or, and the same way of the fear and the worry of getting things we don't want, trying to eliminate that source of pain, preempting it by, uh, you know, breaking some kinds of uh, precepts. But it's very interesting to observe that. And especially how basically it's been created in the mind. And, you know, because we repeat them so often, and then the baby watches other people doing the same things. They watch their parents doing that, their brothers and sisters, you know, with the TV, you know, now with the internet. And every, everywhere, it's reinforcing this idea of, uh, you know, attachment and aversion in and, and the, and the past and the future. And that draws, uh, you know, the mind out of its uh, body or draws it, you know, looking outwardly. And so it loses that intimate connection with the present moment. That's the main thing. It, that the natural connection of the present moment and being, you know, really connected uh, with the body, we gradually lose that. And now we're substituting, we're having to bring happiness from outside into us. And that we cannot really control. And it involves then, uh, you know, doing things that are, are harmful. And, you know, we have to continually, uh, you know, keep bringing more and more pleasure from outside because we've been cut off from the natural happiness of being grounded in the present moment. So really, the, you know, the Buddha really understood that by, you know, observing how it, it happened and so on. Uh, and we can also reflect on that too. And we've lost the natural wisdom that comes with being uh, connected to the body. Look, this this body, right? This human body is supposed to be one, one of the most advanced uh, biological organisms that we know of, as of yet, of course. Uh, or so they say. And it has its natural wisdom. Look, the body was created. It didn't need Einstein or didn't need uh, you know, Bill Gates or IBM computers. No, it was a natural wisdom that created this very intricate, marvelous uh, organism with all of its integrated systems. Even like the immune system, it knows how to heal itself. But somewhere along the line, 
we've interfered with the, the natural functioning of the body by consuming things that are not good for the body. And then, of course, you know, air pollution and other types of things that harm the body uh, in those ways. And they interfere with the, the natural system. So people are developing diabetes or developing heart disease or developing all, you know, all these things. And men, much of it is attributable back to, you know, this disconnect uh, from the body and a disconnect from the present moment. And, and that's really the, you know, the, the, the deepest cause of suffering, even though usually when Buddhists talk about the cause of suffering, they'll say greed, hatred, and delusion is the cause of suffering. Well, I would take it a step further and I say, no, disconnection from the body is the cause of suffering. Because the body is synonymous with the being grounded in the present moment. And the natural happiness that comes from being in the present moment. Because all problems are problems of the past and future. Think of any problem that you have and see if it's not connected in one way or the other with the past or future. Come on, I'll give you 10 seconds. No takers. So, uh, <clears throat> because when the mind is resting in the present moment, there's nothing to judge, there's nothing to compare, there's nothing to fear, nothing to worry about, because all of those t things are connected with the past and the future. <clears throat> and of course, the sense of oneself in that. Is the, all these things are happening to uh, me. So, how do we, you know, begin to reverse that process? And that's exactly what we're doing in the practice of, you know, the, the, the mindfulness meditation. Learning how to get reconnected to, to the body. And another point with that, uh, you know, losing that connection with the, with natural wisdom. A typical example of when you were, you know, young kids and they started smoking. I say this from my own personal experience. I don't know about you. You, <laughs> you know, start smoking because you want to you want to hang out with the older guys, right, or your peers, and they start smoking. So you, you know you. You want to appear to be a you know a tough guy, so you know they give you your first cigarette and you start smoking innocently, you know, and then you kind of keep going because you want to join the in crowd. And then after a few months, you know, start. <coughs> <coughs> so what's the body telling you? The smoking is <laughs> not good for you, right? But the mind, so when you get ready to light up the next cigarette, and the body's trying to tell you, don't do that, don't do that. But the mind says, shut up. Right? And that could be extended to so many other things, right? Eating junk food or uh, doing a number, a lot of things that are not good for us. But then they become habits that uh, then become difficult to, to stop. So nowadays, you know, with all the proliferation of, uh, you know, different types of therapies, different types of pills and, and so many things, and they're all touting, you know, this is going to, you know, cure this kind of problem, this is going to cure that kind of problem, and people are, you know, taking all these pills, medicines, shock treatments, uh, therapies and diets and so many other things kind of forcibly trying to to change the behaviors kind of like from the outside but as we know some of those things may work for a while 
but they don't really get to the deepest root of the the problem. Uh, and, you know, the Buddha saw and understood that, and that's why his whole teaching is formulated on how to get back into harmony uh, with the laws of nature. That means a present moment awareness. Uh, and living uh, according to those, that law of, say, karma and and also of impermanence. One of the other natural laws is impermanence, that everything is constantly changing. Our body is constantly changing, and our mind is even changing faster than the body even. Uh, but we like to think we're in control of it, and we want to, you know, uh, or we don't want it to change. So people get older, and they start worrying about, the, you know, I'm getting old, and, you know, they want to, you know, create the illusion they're not getting old by, you know, various things, right? Uh, and then that only works for a while. But in the end, uh, you know, nothing can stop that. So in, in two accounts, people are not living in harmony with the laws of karma or the law of happiness about, you know, not doing those type of actions that bring painful results and living in the flow, moment to moment flow and change and not uh, trying to stop that change. Because when you stop trying to stop the change, that's when, you know, suffering and pain arises. So that's why the mindfulness of the breathing, the Buddha started with that, he saw that the first thing that needs to be done, not the very first thing, but uh, is to get reconnected to the body. And of course, you know, living by the precepts, like you're living in harmony with the, the law of karma. But even though people, you know, they, they want to follow the precepts, they, they, they often break them, or at least some of them. And why is that? Because you just can't change your behavior by wishful thinking. It's just that, uh, you know, if your TV or refrigerator breaks down, you can't just, uh, you know, put on another coat of paint and expect to, <laughs> to fix itself or push it to another corner. You have to <laughs> get inside you know, and know how it works, and you have to fix it from the inside source, the electrical wires or the circuits or whatever it is. So the same way uh, with changing the way that our mind thinks and changing the behaviors. So the Buddha was really like a scientist. You know, people regard the Buddha as being, you know, the founder of a big religion, you know. Okay, oh, that's just one... <laughs> one attitude uh, that people have about it. But really, pure and simple, the Buddha was a scientist. He wanted to find out the cause of suffering. That's the real scientific attitude. Not trying to find out, you know, how the solar system was created and when the exact date and time when the solar system was created or the earth was created. You know, you we wanted to go deeper than that. Uh, not about the external world. He wanted to know how the internal world was uh, you know, created, and especially the mind. So that's what he, you know, through his deep meditation, he saw that the mind operates through this body. And in order to be able to get sort of be able to observe your mind, to get control of your thoughts, so to speak, you have to be, you know, get reconnected and grounded to uh, the body and in the present moment. So the, you know, 
back in the Buddha's day, you know, there weren't big universities with laboratories and, you know, electron microscopes and, and all these other things. But the, the Buddha used his own body as the laboratory. <clears throat> and actually, you know, when the Buddha left on his search for truth, you know, he wanted to find the source of suffering. So he went out and people were telling, oh, you should go ask that, uh, that guru over there. He, he knows the cause of suffering. Oh, and you better, you know, go ask that one, you know, all these different people that, you know, go, go learn from them. So he went and he learned with a lot of those teachers. They taught him how to meditate and, you know, through some concentration practice, they, he was able to get his get uh, his mind into very expanded states of consciousness sort of like hypnotic states and enter into infinite space infinite consciousness nothingness nothingness wow. you know so he was able to you know through sheer concentration get his mind into those uh, formless jhanas and stay there for hours or even days but then when he came out of that he saw that, yeah, it was nice, but uh, so what? Now, now what? He realized that he hadn't fundamentally changed. He was still locked in ego consciousness and things like that. So he said, how can this be ultimate truth? So he asked his teachers, is this all you got? He said, yeah. So he left that one teacher and went to another one. So the other teacher taught him a, maybe a slightly deeper type of state, but the same kind of result. So like that, he went to several different teachers and finally said, why should I go asking others for the truth? You know, they're a human being, I'm a human being. And so that's when he left them and went on his, you know, found the Bodhi tree and said, oh, this is a suitable place for sitting down to, to meditate. He sat down under the Bodhi tree and made a resolve, I'm not going to leave this seat until I discover the, the ultimate truth or the, the cause of suffering. And so, you know, that's what he did. So he had this scientific attitude. And this body was the laboratory, so he sat down Cross his legs and then focus his attention. And he used his concentration as the microscope. So he, you know, got into the posture and then focus his attention on the breathing. And that the breathing helped take his awareness into uh, the body. So how many of you have taken a college laboratory or a high school laboratory or some kind of laboratory where you had to look down through a microscope, a lab, science lab? So on the first day of college, you have, oh, I have my science lab at, you know, 2 p.m. room 101. You have to find, you have to find the door, right? So you have to walk on down the hall and you come to room 101. Then are you just gonna stare at the doorknob? What do you have to do? You have to open the door and you have to go inside and, and sit down in the chair or stand anyway and look down the microscope. So that is similar to uh, the meditation practice. So finding the door of the laboratory is, you know, just focusing on the posture, you know, kind of developing the ability to kind of hold that outline of the body in the mind's eye. You know, sitting, sitting, or standing, standing. That's finding the door of the laboratory. Then you have to open the door. And that is then focusing on the breathing, doing some deep, slow breathing. So the, the breathing is the bridge 
between the external world and the inner world. We're drawing the air in, strikes the nostrils, comes into the lungs, expanding, contracts. So you're bringing the air from the outside, you know, and then feeling the external surface of the body. And then uh, as you feel the other sensations of expanding, contracting, contracting, it gets you, you know, focused, uh, you know, deeper inside. So that's opening the door and going inside. That means going inside means feeling the subtler sensations. Now, how many of you this morning after doing some yoga stretches that we did or even last night or this morning or even in your meditation, you could feel some subtler sensations, what I call subtler sensations. Anybody think they felt some like that. Did you feel your breathing? Well, that's a subtle sensation. You feel your breathing all the time? Probably not. Because your mind is not focused in the body. So even just the fact that you're actually feeling you know, that sensation of the clothing rubbing against your skin as it expands and contracts, even though that's not a real subtle sensation, it's subtler than your normal state of consciousness. So by starting to feel the various body sensations and being able to just observe them is already that means you're inside the body, so to speak. You kind of you know, first you find the outer body, the clothing touching the skin. Or the feet, the, the buttocks pressing the seat, hands touching together. So that's the outer body. But as you keep your attention there, and then you start focusing on the breathing, then it gets you underneath the skin. Start feeling, uh, you know, you like to feel the pulse of blood or to feel some sensation of warmth or little tingling sensations or little prickly sensations. There's so many. So you start to feel those and that is really uh, getting the mind deeper, you know, inside, getting closer to the source of your thoughts. Because again, as I mentioned, thoughts are arising based from, from the unconscious mind. I mean, everything we've ever experienced, our thought, all the, your memories, emotions connected with memories, and the, the habits that we have, all those things that we've accumulated since we were a baby, basically, are in the unconscious mind, although it's not a kind of a little box somewhere. It's, you know, it's, you can't really exactly describe what it is, but it is there because we can remember things, can't we? How many of you, if you mention your mother's name, even if they died some years ago or somebody else, and your eyes are closed, you could almost, you know, recreate an image of somebody or something where you were, right? So where'd that come from? It just go poof, come into your mind from outer space? No. We don't, can't say exactly where it came from, but we call it the unconscious mind. Uh, because yours is going to be different than his or mine, depending on the kind of a life we, we've led and the memories that you have. Anyway, so, uh, but normally we don't, you know, see those uh, thoughts in their uh, uh, origin as they, as they first come up. Now, how many of you in your meditation this morning got lost in your thoughts? Really? Why? Why did you get lost in your thoughts? You ever think about it? So I'll keep it simple. You didn't see them coming. Right? You didn't see them coming because you weren't focused enough. 
So the thought comes up, but because we're distracted, either we're kind of half sleepy or we're lost in some other thoughts, we don't see these other impulses as they're working their way up from the unconscious uh, to what we call the conscious mind. Now, there's no exact dividing line between the conscious mind and unconscious mind. But in meditation, when you develop concentration, what used to be unconscious, now you're becoming conscious of it. So just the fact that you can concentrate on your breathing or you scan the attention through the body, feeling various sensations, you're already at an unconscious level. But now it's conscious, you've made them conscious or you've brought your threshold of consciousness down deeper. So you're aware of things that you ordinarily would have not been aware of. And so that that is what happens in the, you know, in the process of meditation, and especially when you're developing uh, awareness and and concentration. How many of you maybe during your meditation this morning uh, could see a thought kind of just pop into the mind? And it kind of surprised you even. Anybody? So that itself is a kind of, you know, that experience about now you actually saw a thought you know, come up out of the mind. But normally we don't see them because we're not uh, focused. We're so distracted, either caught up in our anger or our sadness or whatever emotions that we're getting caught up into or we're just our mind is racing to the future so that that cuts off all the access to uh, you know the unconscious so only when you are primarily you know in, in a meditative state and not dissipating one's energy then uh, gradually if you maintain that long enough you will start to feel is a uh, you know the uh, the flow of impermanence. So, so the first stage of meditation, as I've already been mentioning, is learning how to just develop the ability to stay focused in the breathing body, you know, for longer and longer periods of time, and and overcoming the hindrances. It's the hindrances that block that ability to. Uh, you know, to be in the present moment. And, and the hindrances arise because the way we live our life. And so, you know, the hindrances basically are, you know, uh, sleepiness, ad men mental agitation, uh, you know, greed, thinking about greed, what can I want, I want this, all. you know, or lustful fantasies, uh, you know, anger, remembering the past and getting upset and somebody rehashing the past and uh, so all the, the, the thoughts and worries, agitation. Uh, and those are arise because of the way we've lived our life. And so that's why, you know, when you start to meditate, like, living by the with the precepts and so on is an important part because it's breaking the precepts that in is a large degree causing so much of the hindrances uh, that then plague our mind such as you know guilt worry remorse and fear and the agitation that that, that uh, induces into the nervous system and that's why these things like meditation and following the precepts are kind of go hand in hand because they of the way they they balance and they integrate uh, with each other and you can observe that even through your you know your own experience so but anyway so you know coming back to to getting centered and grounded in the body uh, and developing the mindfulness. Mindfulness is the moment-to-moment -moment, uh, attention. And a lot of people, they make a difference between mindfulness and concentration. If you've, you know, ever visited some of these Dhamma chat groups or listened to various uh, 
lectures by different, uh, you know, meditators and, uh, and so on. Uh, you know, some people will say, or, no, I just practice mindfulness meditation, or I just do vipassana meditation. Others say, no, I just do concentration. And they, they, some people say, oh, you don't need concentration to practice mindfulness. And others uh, say that being mindful is a distraction for concentration, but that's all been turned upside down. And uh, you have to have mindfulness in order to develop concentration. Because you have to be mindful of the hindrances. If you're not mindful of the hindrance and you're constantly being plagued by drowsiness or you're constantly, you know, agitated and getting, you know, disturbed by pains and, you know, wanting to get away from all these uh, irritations or, or plagued by your memories and so on, you're never going to attain concentration. So you have to be mindful of your thoughts and you can't be mindful of your thoughts without being mindful of the mindful of the body really. Maybe in advanced levels you can, but not really for uh, beginners because uh, they have a, there's a certain kind of natural progression. Of first getting in touch with the body and getting centered and then you naturally then start observing the subtler impulses that trigger off your thoughts you know like hearing a sound how many people heard a sound in the you know in their, in their meditations that you started thinking about a sound anybody so why do you think about a sound it's just a sound what's it got to do with you What does that have to do with you? But yet the mind creates a melodrama out of it, right? Justifying that that sounds bothering me. And why are they doing that? Or whatever it might be. And it does that for th things that you smell and see and hear and even think about. So that's why the mindfulness is important the mindfulness uh, is that alertness when you hear a sound you just say, oh, okay it's just hearing so it, it creates a, a a little space in which you go okay it's just a sound so what's so big deal about the sound and then if it triggers off a thought you can say oh thinking thinking it's just a thought about the sound thinking about a sound is not the sound Sound is one thing, thinking about the sound is another thing. And then also recognizing a thought. If you start to get angry, you can just make a note, ah, anger is arising. So noticing a thought is not the same as thinking about it. Because you can notice I'm getting angry now, and if you have good mindfulness, it stops there. You don't continue to think about the object that caused your anger. But if you're not mindful, you start identifying with the object that caused the anger. You're no longer looking at the anger. You're looking at the object that caused your anger, which could be another person or, you know, could be Mita jumping on the table or it could be, you know, any number of things. So, but this is part of the actual, you know, the practice of right understanding and the practice of the, the mindfulness is to incorporate this clear comprehension. So along with the practice of mindfulness, there's something called clear comprehension. That means understanding what you're mindful of. But usually there's not much understanding because these uh, the, the habitual reactions, the automatic reactions to things uh, sort of, you know, prevents us from being able to objectively observe yourself or to ask yourself okay anger is arisen and, you know, why am I getting angry at this I mean, really I mean is it really hurting me you're angry because somebody has slammed the door because somebody you know drove up and been making noise outside <clears throat> so you keep on asking your questions 
then you keep on getting answers back. And all the answers lead back to the I, the sense of oneself. I didn't, I don't like it. I wanted that and they prevented me from getting that. Or I'm so bad, I'll never be, never amount to anything. All these things we've been programmed to, we've heard of, you know, from others our whole life. And we've identified with these, you know, that's what's, that has created the, what's called the inner and outer tangle. So in, in the meditation practice, that's what we're, we're trying to untangle the tangle. And that was a little, a little uh, a jingle that was brought to the Buddha. So some, some, some deva, some people came to the Buddha and they said, Oh, Master Gautama says, the outer tangle and the inner tangle. This world is entangled in a tangle. And I asked Master Gautama, who succeeds in disentangling this tangle? That was actually a question posed to the Buddha. And the Buddha's reply was, when a person is standing on the foundation of, uh, you know, skillful conduct, that means observing precepts, living in harmony with the laws of nature, then develops the mental powers of mindfulness, concentration and wisdom, that person succeeds in disentangling uh, the tangle. And what is the tangle? Well, the outer tangle is all the multitudinous objects of what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and so on. Then what is the inner tangle? Yeah, the way the mind has gotten tangled up in loves and hates uh, and delusions based on its, you know, its conditioning over the years and holding on tightly as knots. The mind has been tied in knots with greed, hatred, aversion, delusion, pride, envy, jealousy, the whole gamut of, uh, of sensations. And, you know, tied up in identifying oneself with all of these things. That's what, you know, and every time we repeat one of these kind of uh, thoughts or delusions or repeat a negative habit, it's like you're pulling on the, the knot tighter. And so, you know, really the whole practice of Dhamma is about loosening the knots unraveling the knots, disentangling this tangle to free our consciousness. And that is done through, you know, the practice of the, of the Noble Eightfold Path, but uh, specifically the practice of, you know, developing mindfulness, concentration and wisdom. Uh, but uh, that actually unties those knots of our mind. <clears throat> and so, you know, the, the practice of meditation, as I've already been talking about, it's first to become, you know, centered and grounded in the, with the, in the breathing body and using things like yoga exercise and deep breathing to help to facilitate that and uh, then developing you know mindfulness to observe the hindrances and to gain more concentration so actually concentration is simply unbroken mindfulness
you know, people practice this concentration on breathing and they think it's concentration practice, but the Buddha didn't, he called it mindfulness of breathing. He didn't call it concentration on breathing, he called it mindfulness of breathing. Following the in breaths and the out breaths. When it becomes unbroken, it becomes concentrated, but it's simply unbroken mindfulness. It's going from moment to moment without being interrupted by any of the hindrances. That's a concentrated state. Um, and it's like the longer you can stay in that uh, flow of awareness without being broken by the, the hindrances, that's like turning up the power of a microscope. So you, you know, in the science lab, when you put something under a microscope, let's say you got a drop of blood or a piece of skin. And, you know, you, you see it there, you know, you're looking at the outer piece of skin and you put it, you know, under the microscope. And then you, you know, turn the power up to power of, you know, whatever, 10, 15, 20 then the outer skin kind of disappears. At a certain point, you start to just seeing, you know, a lot of cells, right? So now the outer skin has disappeared. And then if you turn the power, the microscope even more to a hundred or so, even cells disappear. Now you're seeing molecules. And if you turn the power of the microscope even more, the molecules disappear and you might be seeing just like DNA or all these other things, you know, atoms. You keep up turning the power and you can see, you know, the electrons. And then you, you keep turning it up and basically you smash the atom into nothingness. And basically, that's what the practice of meditation uh, kind of accomplishes in terms of, you know, you sit down and you feel the outer body, right? But then as you focus on the breathing and you start to feel the subtler sensations, you know, and you tune into that, you're feeling more and more sensations, which are basically just cellular vibrations. Now you're no longer uh, feeling the external body. Now you're feeling the inner you know, body. And as you remain more and more concentrated, then even those, a lot of those sensations will vanish. And uh, you, you'll, or you'll start to then experience uh, uh, the thoughts. You can see the, the thoughts arising. Uh, especially when you uh, like painful and pleasurable feelings, you stop reacting to painful and pleasurable uh, feelings. You're able to do that through the concentration. Until you're concentrated, you still get bothered by pain. You know, and so you know, I've seen people, you know, in meditation, they, they go like this, <laughs> they go like this. Anybody do that in meditation? So why do you do that? You weren't relaxed enough, basically. Or you didn't have enough mindfulness to just say, ah, itching, itching. You just watch the itch. Watch it with the attitude of like a, a child watching some ants crawling on the ground, you know. Wow. Instead, we, oh, So we can observe the body and say, wow, look at all these sensations. Wow. The itchy sensation here, there's a stinging sensation over here, biting sensation over here. You go, wow, cool, you know. And just learn to observe them and even enjoy it. You might see the urge to scratch and you say, relax, relax, no big deal. And you relax and then you say, wow, yeah, it was, I, can, I, can, I can do that. And and you start to get an enjoyment out of just watching all the different things that are going on in the body. First, you know, the sensations. 
even the painful or unpleasant ones. You can learn to endure them uh, when, you're, when you reach a deeper state of concentration. And other distractions too, like loud sounds won't bother you anymore. And uh, you know, the mind gets deeper and deeper centered, uh, you know, in the present uh, moment. And, you know, you can see the mind's potential for reaction, but you, because your mindfulness is very sharp and deep now, uh, you don't, you don't uh, pay attention to them. You know, you just, you know, be aware of us, just hearing, hearing, feeling, feeling, pain, pain. And, and you see how they're constantly changing. So when you're able to observe things coming and going, that's the flow of impermanence. So, uh, you know, the, the purpose of gaining that centeredness in the breathing body is so that you can see how everything just comes and goes. Just being centered in the body itself is not the goal. It's only the beginning. And then instead of just uh, getting content with that, and you know, when people g gain some concentration, they start feeling some pleasant sensations, and it's like, ah, oh, so nice. You kind of give up that focused concentration and just uh, you know want to hang out and some kind of superficial happiness and then the pra practice kind of stagnates so but the goal is actually to observe how quickly different sensations and thoughts are arising and vanishing but you can only do that when you're not reacting to things and you start to notice more and more things coming and going when the mind gets centered, I mean, you can notice sensations from all different parts of your body pretty much simultaneously. And like within the space of one or two seconds, you could easily experience 20, 30, 40, 50 or more sensations just because that's the way they're functioning. That's the way that's happening. Uh, this is, a, you know, electrical magnetic energy you know, it's in the brain firing off neurons and so on is happening at a tremendous speed, you know, millions of times within a second. And uh, of course, you may not experience it to that degree, but you can, you know, it's a gradual process. So, so you train on the breathing. That's why the breathing is given as a beginning object, because the in-breath has a beginning and an end, right? And then the outbreath has a beginning and an end. Was anybody able to notice the beginning and end of an in-breath or an out-breath? And so you train on, on just, uh, you know, the, the focus in is on impermanence. Seeing how quickly sensations just, you know, come and go. Even in one in-breath, it's not just one sensation, it's a whole series of sensations that, you know, like four or five or six in just one, because it's the expansion of the rib cage. Each minute expansion of the rib cage in a breath pushes material out of the way that's causing rippling sensations through the nervous system. So especially when you're taking a deeper breath, like and you're feeling that, that's when you can really notice it very, very clearly. And then uh, the out breath also. So you tune into that. And by doing that, you get concentrated. It, it, it pulls your mind into that. And so that you're not getting worried about other things going on around you too much. But even while you're doing that, you might feel something, you know, on your some other part of the body might notice a, a body twitch. And that just arises and vanishes too. But normally we stop and we try to grab the object and we try to think about it and like it or dislike it and judge it. And that's what slows the mind down. But instead, 
the trick in the meditation is learning how to uh, systematically tune in to the impermanence and train the mind is to observe without reacting or clinging and to see how quickly the things are just uh, uh, changing. And so, you know, that, that goes to many, many uh, deeper levels. <clears throat> anyway, there's a lot more that can be uh, said about that, but uh, I'm just wanted to uh, mention that about this, uh, you know, the transition from, you know, developing mindfulness, getting centered and grounded in the body, that is for the purpose of being able to see then tune in to notice how things quickly change and how they're conditioned. You hear a sound and immediately you see a thought, you know, pop into your mind. So you're like, or you feel a sensation there and immediately, you know, a thought pops into the mind about it. But you don't follow them because there's always something else you can notice. The reason why we get stuck on objects is because we fail to notice the other things that are going on around. So, uh, anyway, so uh, I think I'll bring this uh, Dhamma talk to an end right now. And uh, if any of you have any questions, if you have any, uh, you know, questions or Right, right now, is it fresh in your mind? You could ask a question now. Uh, otherwise, you could write it down for a, a question later this evening. But if you have any questions about anything I was just talking about, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. Don't be shy. Yes. Okay. Um, normally, when we practice. We, we, feel, we feel that there is certain pleasure in being in the present moment in, in the body and that helps us to keep uh, in the present moment. But there are some uh, times in life where we will be feeling like chronic pain or certain mental states that are very strong in a way that you try to react and avoid them as much as you can. So what are your suggestions when these, these very um, aversive states either of the mind or the body interferes in staying in the present moment? At that point, you make that disturbance or that whatever it is, a negative thought or some physical pain <clears> or <throat> reaction to it. You invite it in and put it down in front of you and ask the questions. What's so important about you? Why are you painful? Who's experiencing this pain? You can ask a number of questions about it. And why don't you like that? And then wait for an answer. And as I already mentioned before, you'll probably, your answers will probably come back. Well, it hurts. Okay, who does it hurt? Well, me. You know, everything comes back to me, the I. So when you're investigating it like that, the thought may just completely vanish by itself. Because thoughts like to hide in the dark. It's like cockroaches at night that come out in your kitchen when it's dark. When you come in, you flip on the light, what happens? They all scatter. Right? Or when the cat is up on the table and at night, you know, the mice are running around, they come out to get some cheese, you know, and they see the cat sleeping, so the mice come out. But then the cat opens his eyes. The mouse sees that cat eye and they, whoosh, they go back in the hole. So the same way our, our thoughts like to hide in the dark. So when you shine the light of understanding on them, they, they scatter. 
because they don't want to be made a fool of. Uh, and deep down inside, the mind knows the truth. So anyway, you can apply this. As, this is what is called investigation of Dhamma, the second factor of enlightenment. And so you can use this type of analytic thinking for things that keep on coming back to you over and over, you know, as hindrances, like certain thoughts. You know, and you ask it, what's so important about this thought? Why am I angry at some second cousin that insulted me? Or an ex that did this or that? Is it really hurting me? You know, keep asking it questions and you'll, you'll see in the end, you'll see it's just useless. Where there's nothing you can do about it. And worrying about it, it causes you more suffering than hurting the person that maybe you may be thinking about. So this is part of that. And then, then the thought will drop away by itself quite often. Or a pain. Maybe you're, oh, it's going to, maybe this is an illness that's going to cause me death. So ask it. Okay, you might die from it, so what? So what? I have to see my grandkids graduate from college. Why are you afraid of death? So these are questions the Buddha kept on poking, poking the bear, you know, our unconscious mind to find out what is the root of the root that's causing us, you know, so much agitation. And the, the Buddha saw it was because of these deep entangled roots of greed, hatred, and delusion. And having been disconnected from the body and being trapped in the ego, See, the baby didn't have the ego in the beginning. The baby's mind didn't have any sense of I or in it. Only after it got us a name and, you know, they, they started calling its name and it started to look. And what used to be expansive oceanic awareness, it started to coagulate and get fixed behind the eyeballs, the idea of oh, I am somebody. That wasn't there in the beginning. That's not part of the natural mind. That's what's really important to understand. That's the foundation of understanding no self. So, you know, these are the ways that we use that kind of uh, analytic thinking to, and it's not abstract thinking, it's about observing it as it's happening in your mind and asking the questions then. You know, especially the ones that keep on re recurring over and over again. People are thinking about the future. So now people are panicking about all this new DNA stuff, right? So everybody's getting their DNA analyzed to find out what diseases their parents had, their grandparents, their eighth grade grandfather. And then worrying about, oh, am I going to get this? Am I going to get that? Maybe, maybe one out of 10 times that could occur, but most of the time it's the mind creating mountains out of molehills. Maybe not all the time, but even even if you do, what are you going to do? So the contemplation about impermanence and the nature of death and so on, and why should we, we be scared of death? Is, is it important, uh, one of the adjunct kind of uh, contemplations or reflections that we have, you know, about uh, the nature of life, that everything is born? In fact, you know, life is not certain. There's only one certainty in life, and that's death. Because you don't know how long you're going to live, do you? But you, can, you, can you predict when you're going to die? Because people die the very next day don't they? Or an hour after they thought they were going to live to be 90 years old, they're dead already. And whatever unknown causes, conditions, 
you know, whether it's a natural disaster, lightning bolt comes down and kills you, or a snake <laughs> bite, or getting COVID, right? So how many people came out of nowhere? And just boom, 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 within a few weeks, so many thousands of people died. So, and, and this is nature. We, we, you know, this is the, the nature of all life. It is not something morbid. It's just accepting that this is the nature of life. So when it happens, you know, say, why me? I did all the right things. But yet things happen to good, bad things happen to good people. And good things happen to bad people. That's the mystery of life. Of course, it's all connected with karma, but, you know, it's a, it's a reflection that, uh, that uh, are, is useful to, to contemplate. So when things happen, you say, okay, that was in the cards, okay. And you'll be able to be more accepting of things that may happen, but it can also cause you to be more careful in your life. And what are you doing? That, that may have caused certain types of accidents or other things to happen. Because nothing happens without a, a cause. Yes? When you're doing this investigation of Dhamma and asking these questions in the way that you were showing us, is there a benefit to asking those questions in an almost interrogator style where, where there's almost this attitude of challenge as opposed to asking questions with an attitude of soft-heartedness or compassion? Yes, challenge yourself. Endure that pain. Why do you want to move the leg right now? Why do you want to itch that scratch? Or scratch that itch. Why do you want to think this right now? Challenge yourself. That's right. But you have to do it in a, you know, relaxed, you know, a kind of a, this is like a, a mother training the child, right? The child goes to pick up something that may be dangerous and want to put it in the mouth. So the mother comes and has to, you know, maybe slap the hand a bit or you know, we'll pull it away uh, because you don't know what it's doing, right? So that the child has to be trained. And if they keep on doing the same thing, sometimes you have to be a little firm with it. But then that's the way, you know, they learn. Like even when, you know, nowadays they don't do that anymore. But when I was growing up as a kid, you know, if you did something wrong, or dad would take you out and, you know, beat you with a belt or something like that or spankings and no, oh, you can't spank the little child. He's such a good little boy. No, whack him. <laughs> but you do it with compassion, <laughs> you know? And they, they wake up, they learn, they don't want to get hit again. So they stop saying four letter words to their mother or father or flipping them the finger or whatever, <laughs> you know, but it's going to help them in the future. So, you know, that's the kind of attitude. It's about finding a balance. You know, if you're too hard on yourself, then that could lead to problems, but it has to be done with wisdom. That's why right understanding is the first step of the Eightfold Path, the right understanding. And when you have that right understanding, which means contemplating these various things that I've been mentioning and developing mindfulness, uh, then the, the, the right answers will come to you because we all have that natural wisdom inside. Okay, anyway, uh, I think we'll go ahead and finish uh, this discussion now so we can carry on our meditation practice. And if, uh, you know, during the breaks later on, like the evening tea break, uh, you could write down any remaining questions or any new questions come up in your meditation. You can write them down or, or during the tea break and then during the puja tonight we'll try to answer them. okay so now just uh while it's still fresh in your mind just uh try to sit up a little. we're going to stand up in a minute but just uh 
Just try to sit up fairly straight and take a deep, slow breath. Close your eyes or let go of all that outward focus. And just take a deep, slow breath, really expand your lungs and hold the air in as long as you comfortably can. Feel those subtle sensations. Just tell yourself, sitting, sitting. And let out the breath, feel that relaxation of the out breath. Just take two more breaths like that. Get the mind focused back in the body. Okay, now mindfully stand up to relieve any buildup of discomfort in the, in the legs. We'll do a short standing and then maybe a short walking around before sitting down again. And for those who have tuned in over Zoom, we're going to close this uh, session now. Try to do some meditation on your own.